Welcome back, everyone, to our sixth episode of our journey through history. Today, we are going to continue reading from Richard Holmes' The Napoleonic Wars, and we're going to begin with Chapter 15, Cavalry. Napoleon built up a formidable cavalry force, most notably of heavy cuirassiers, which played a vital role on the battlefield, but demanded considerable logistical support. There are three types of cavalry in the French Imperial Army. The cuirassiers were perhaps the most distinctive of all. Amongst the 25 regiments, heavy cavalry in 1799 was one that wore the cuirass, body armor then considered rather old-fashioned, and Napoleon's cuirassier arm grew from the small beginning. From 1802, cuirasses were issued more widely but the first 12 regiments designated cuirassiers the following year. The 13th to 18th regiments became dragoons, and the remainder were disbanded and their men posted to the new cuirassier regiments. A 13th regiment was raised in 1809, and in 1810, a Dutch regiment became the 14th. Two regiments of carabineers heavy horsemen who had long before been named from the carbines they had carried when such things were uncommon, retained their title, but from 1810 were equipped as cuirassiers. Heavy cavalry existed to break opposing cavalry or infantry by the shock of their charge, and the cuirassier's breast and backplate and fur-turbaned steel helmet with a tall brass comb was believed to give him an advantage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. However, a British officer who met cuirassiers at Waterloo thought this an encumbrance and inconvenience, quite useless as protection to the man. When exposed to shot, shell, or point-blank musketry, the head, throat, and legs being unprotected and exposed also to the sure points of a good swordsman. Ironically, the cuirass still worn on ceremonial occasions by British household cavalry, made its reappearance in the British army after the Napoleonic Wars. 18th century armies raised light cavalry for scouting and outpost work. The original French light cavalry with a chasseur à cheval, 31 regiments strong by 1811, who saw regiments, their men originally modeled on horsemen from the Great Plain of Hungary also existed before the Revolution. And several irregular units, like Les Guides de Armée de Allemagne and Les Hussars de la Liberté, were incorporated into the regular army. There were ten Hussar regiments by 1810. When a Dutch regiment became the 11th, two more were raised in 1814. Polish lancers entered the French service in 1807, and from 1811, there were six regiments of Chavard Leger Lancier de France and two of Poles, with a ninth regiment, originally German dragoons, soon added. Dragoons were a hybrid. They began as mounted infantry, but were well on their way to being cavalry proper, with 18 regiments in 1791 rising to 30, although in 1811, Six of these were converted into lancers. Dragoons wore green uniforms topped by a brass helmet with a leopard tur skin turban and carried musket and bayonet as well as sword. There were often too few horses to mount all troopers and some went to war on foot to be mounted if the opportunity came. Cavalry regiments, like their infantry counterparts, were commanded by colonels and contained around 550 men. The organization varied. Most had a small headquarters and eight troops. Captains' commands around 60 men apiece, usually grouped into four squadrons. The first troop of this first squadron was the Compagnie d'Elite, and often celebrated the fact by wearing fur busbies. All this cavalry demanded the constant supply and resupply of horses, in March of 1805, only 700 of the 1,060 cavalrymen in Davout's corps had horses, 
and 300 men in each Dragoon Regiment marched on foot. The defeat of Prussia in 1806 enabled cavalry to be remounted from captures and repositions. But the 1812 campaign in Russia was disastrous for horses as well as men. And although Napoleon's agents brought over 21,000 mounts in two months, there were repeated demands on France with voluntary donations and requisitions. Supply rarely met demand. By February of 1813, one remount depot had received 765 of the expected 2,500 cuirassier horses. 350 of the 600 dragoon horses and 277 of 700 draft horses. Lowering the required standards helped make up numbers, but often put French horsemen at a disadvantage. We will now move into Chapter 16, Napoleon in Spain. Napoleon occupied Spain to buttress his continental system, but initial success against a British expeditionary force created a black hole into which badly needed French resources were soon sucked. In December of 1807, Napoleon promulgated the Milan Decrees, outlawing neutral shipping that visited Britain. His continental system, already begun by the Berlin Decrees, had not frozen British trade. Portugal was prominent amongst its flouters, and Napoleon planned to invade it, not simply to close this loophole, but to provide a springboard in case Spain, at this juncture nominally France's ally, needed showing a firm hand. Napoleon built up an army under Junot and issued an ultimatum to the Portuguese regent. Prince John was prepared to comply with all its terms save one. And that was enough for Napoleon. The Spaniards allowed Junot into their territory in September, and in October, the Treaty of Fontainebleau formalized arrangements. Junot made excellent progress, passing Salamanca on the 12th of November and entering Lisbon on the 30th. However, a British squadron had spirited away Prince John, his court, and the Portuguese fleet. Junot's men set about systematic looting so that the campaign might at least pay for itself. Napoleon again considered invading Britain, but many of the invasion barges collected at the Bologna before Austerlitz had since rotted, and there was little chance of commanding Channel. Instead, he decided to secure Sicily, send an army through Spain to Gibraltar and North Africa, thus severing Britain's grasp on the Mediterranean, and finally to dispatch a fleet to the east to wreck British trade. French troops in Spain secured key fortresses by a variety of ruses, and in May of 1808, Napoleon forced King Charles IV and his son Ferdinand to abdicate, together with the influential royal favorite Manuel Godoy to exile in France. Napoleon invited his brothers Louis and Lucien to assume the vacant throne, and when they declined, ordered another brother, Joseph, the king of Naples, to Madrid bestowing the throne of Naples to his brother-in-law and the cavalry commander Joachim Marat. Things had already gone wrong. On the 2nd of May in 1808, Madrid rose against its occupiers, and the insurrection spread. Many civil officials and military commanders feared the rising's populist streak, but provincial juntas encouraged resistance on behalf of the popular Ferdinand, the fatherland and the faith. The British quickly took advantage, repatriating a Spanish corps from the Baltic and sending Wellesley to Portugal. He beat Junot at Vimero on the 21st of August, and the Convention of Centra, signed by Wellesley and two senior generals who had superseded him, agreed that the French would be evacuated from Portugal in British ships. The convention was deeply unpopular in Britain, for the French took away a good deal of their loot and it almost cost Wellesley his career, but was a humiliation for the French. Even worse was the news that Dupont's corps had been encircled by Spanish regulars at Bailen in July and forced to surrender. 
Napoleon determined to go southwards himself to get the machine working again. He first traveled to Eufort to meet the Tsar in an effort to ensure Russian quiescence during his absence, then departed for Spain, believing that he had settled matters behind him. In November, he burst like a whirlwind on the Spanish armies and recaptured Madrid in early December. He was preparing to move on Lisbon, but a small British force under Moore had made a circuitous journey from Lisbon to Salamanca before striking at Valladolid. Napoleon thundered after him in late December, crossing the Guadarrama in snow and almost catching Moore as he withdrew to Coruna. Early in January of 1809, Napoleon left for France, leaving Soult to complete the pursuit. Moore was killed as his army defended its evacuation port, but most of the British escaped. As Napoleon re-entered France, he left behind him the Spanish ulcer, already gnawing bloodily into French manpower. We will now enter into Chapter 17, Napoleon's Family. The empire became a family affair as Napoleon entrusted to his brothers subordinate kingdoms in Holland and Spain, but for his own heir, he had to wait until 1811. Charles and Letizia Buonaparte had five surviving sons and three daughters. Charles died in 1785, but Letizia survived to become a dignified queen mother, Madame Mira, dying after Napoleon in 1836. Napoleon looked after his siblings, though with varying success. My brothers are nothing except through me, he ranted. His eldest brother Joseph, born in 1768, studied for the bar and carried out diplomatic duties in 1800 to 1806 when he was installed as King of Naples. He was a humane and popular ruler, but in 1808 Napoleon summarily moved him to Spain. Even there his affability shone through. But he was in an impossible position faced with a divided nation and a major war. Returning to France after the defeat at Vittoria in 1813, he immigrated to the USA after Waterloo and farmed near Bordentown, New Jersey. He returned to Europe in 1832 and would die in 1844. Lucien, born in 1775, was altogether more determined. He became a member of the Council of 500 in 1798 and was elected its president just before the Brumaire coup, in which he played a leading part. He was successful both as Minister of the Interior and Ambassador to Madrid, but offered the crowns of both Sicily and Spain on condition that he divorce his bourgeoisie wife, resolutely declined, and lived on his estate near Rome, where the Pope made him Prince of Canino, Lucien fell out with his brother when the French troops were sent into Rome in 1810. The ship carrying him to America was captured by the British, and he spent the rest of the Napoleonic Wars living as a country gentleman at Ludlow in Shropshire and Thorngrove in Worcestershire. He returned to Italy, where he died in 1840. Louis was born in 1778 and served in the French army. After his marriage to Napoleon's stepdaughter, Hortense, he became King of Holland in 1806. Hortense bore him two sons, the second of whom became Emperor Napoleon III. But the marriage was unhappy, as was Louis's time in Holland. He was rebuked by his brother for putting Dutch interests above those of France, and was forced to abdicate in 1810. Thereafter, as Comte de Salut, he lived in Austria, Switzerland, and Italy, preoccupied with his health, as there were concerns about his mental stability, and his literary endeavors, and would die in 1846. The youngest brother, Jerome, was born in 1784 and served in the Navy before immigrating to the USA, where he married Elizabeth Patterson in 1803. In 1807, Napoleon made him monarch of the new kingdom of Westphalia, having divorced him from his wife and married him off to Princess Catherine of Württemberg. He served as a corps commander with mixed fortunes, for his attacks on Hougoumont 
cost Napoleon valuable time at Waterloo. He received his marshal's baton from his nephew, Napoleon III, and died in 1860. Elisa Bonaparte, born in 1777, became Grand Duchess of Tuscany. She had something of Napoleon's manner and enjoyed reviewing troops from horseback. Pauline was born in 1780. She married General Leclerc in 1797 and accompanied him on an expedition to Haiti, where he died. She then married Camilla Borges, a Roman prince, but complained bitterly when her husband was sent to govern Piedmont. She returned to Paris and enjoyed a racy lifestyle. The sculptor Canova produced a nude sculpture of her, and when asked how she could bear to pose for it, allegedly replied that it was no problem because there was a fire in the studio. Caroline, born in 1792, married Joachim Marat, Napoleon's most successful cavalry commander. She became Grand Duchess of Berg when Marat was given a state in North Germany and became Queen of Naples after his elevation. Napoleon married the sweet and matchless Josephine de Bernays, widow of the guillotine general, in 1796. Her elegance and charm did much for Napoleon, who forgave her for, for a major affair, and he treated her children Eugène and Hortense as his own, making the former viceroy of Italy and marrying the latter to his brother Louis. Josephine could not bear him an heir, and he divorced her in 1810 to marry the plump and pretty Austrian princess, Marie-Louise, who duly presented him with a son in 1811. Napoleon described his many affairs as pastimes that do not in the least engage in my feelings. His mistresses included the actress Mademoiselle Georges, the Polish beauty Marie Valeska, who bore him a son Alexander, who became a distinguished diplomat and statesman under the Second Empire, and the singer Giuseppina Grassini. The latter later enjoyed the favors of the Duke of Wellington and reported him a better lover, which may suggest that in love, as in much else, Napoleon was deeply selfish. I hope you enjoyed this latest episode of A Journey Through History. Tune in next time, where we will enter into Chapter 18, The Fogrum Campaign. I'll see y'all then. Take care.